Hello and welcome back to the Ascent Cycling Podcast for the daily recap number 9 of the 2021 Giro d'Italia following a very, very important stage in the Giro today between Castel di Sangro and Campo Felice. Apologies for the uh, lack of daily recap 7 and 8. We've had some technical issues uh, with the recordings and we felt like the quality of the content would not have been um, up to the standards of content we want to produce. Uh, so therefore, they haven't been released. Um, but yeah. Hopefully, moving forward, we won't have them issues and we'll continue uh, uploading daily because it is something I really enjoy doing. I think uh, it is reciprocal for you, Joe. Certainly is. Certainly is, my friend. So, as I was saying, today's stage was a very important one uh, because it was the first stage not won by a breakaway. Um, I mean, we've had sprint stages, obviously, but every stage that wasn't a sprint had been won by a breakaway and today could have been the case if it hadn't been for a certain Colombian of the team Ineos, Egan Bernal taking his maiden Grand Tour stage win uh, today in Campo Felice, uh, winning in a dominant, dominant manner uh, ahead of Giro Ciccone and Alexander Vlasov wrapping up the, uh, the podium. Joe, what did you make of Egan Bernal's win today? I mean, it was an action-packed stage, wasn't it? Egan Bernal was unbelievable unbelievable on the final climb but we had so much action for the entirety of the stage 158 kilometers we had a lot of a lot of climbs i think four categorized climbs and four climbs over 10 kilometers in length as well um none of them were particularly still steep sorry until the final ascent and we we had a long selection process of trying uh, to get in the breakaway uh, which also saw Bahrain victorious attack with Damiano Caruso, their GC leader. Matej Mohoric went down as well. Uh, we're not quite sure the state of Mohoric, but obviously wishing him the best. It seemed like a very nasty crash, didn't it, in that descent. So wishing Mohoric all the best. But uh, the breakaway finally did go. They never got a massive lead either. So it was always touch and go between the breakaway or the Peloton snatching the stage win. Ineos ramped it up. They had Gianni Moscon setting a infernal tempo on the front in that final 2K on the graveled sector um, up to Campo Felice. And then Bernal attacks and no one got even close to staying with him. It was an unreal attack and he blew everyone away today. He really did. He really did. And uh, as you mentioned, so we've had an attack of Damiano Caruso. We had Matti Moritz. I think there was one other rider from Bahrain. Maybe I think Gino Meda might have been in the breakaway trying to defend uh, the uh, Maria Azzurra, Maria Azzurra, that is now going to be on the shoulders of Geoffrey Bouchard, who was in the breakaway and was in contention for the win until the last 300 meters. Um, but yeah, breakaway never got more than six minutes due to Tanel Kangat being in the break. I think he was roughly six minutes down on Attila Valta. Uh, and then Ineos just swooped in, pacing first with um, Salvatore Puccio. Then uh, some different teams decided to take the lead of the peloton. Then Jonathan Castroviejo doing an incredible work before the final 2k where Yanni Moscon absolutely obliterated everyone uh, but Egan Bernal and then an attack that first of all in it's it's a showcase of power of like actual muscle power but just the mental aspect of that attack is unreal it's just, I, I said exactly that in the podcast mm -hmm. yesterday that you could not have listened to uh, but I said that it would have been the, a massive statement for a GC guy to win and the way Bernal won today, knowing that we're going to have the Strade Bianche in, well, the BTEC Strade Bianche in just two days, is scary. It really is. I agree. Because obviously, a short climb today, and looking at it, the top GC contenders all within 12 seconds of Egan Bernal. So it's not about the time gaps really here, but the mental aspect, like you say, he blew everyone away. No one could get close to staying with him on this climb. So... With uh, the Montalcino stage, like you say, coming up on Wednesday, I think, stage 11 of this race. What's the Ineos going to do there? With the likes of Gianni Moscon, they could be absolutely scary for some of these other GC riders. I mean, if they put Moscon on the front and attack with Egan Bernal in his wheel, I can see a lot of GC contenders losing the Giro on that day for sure. It should be great. Great viewing for us, at least. Absolutely, absolutely. For, for the riders of the Peloton that aren't in the Ineos team, probably won't be as fun as it will be for us. Uh, one thing, though, to mention, today Ineos managed to not destroy the race, but do a lot of damage, and that was without using Filippo Ganna. I think Ganna is resting for the Montalcino stage, and the perspectives of him just doing what he does best on the Strade Bianche for Egan Bernal might be um, very dangerous. 
Certainly will be. Ghana and Moscon. I mean, Moscon today looks just so strong on that gravelled set. So I can see him doing exactly the same on the on the Montecino stage as well. So him with Ghana is going to be doubly scary for the Ineos Grenadiers. They already have some other strong domestiques as well with options to send the likes of Danny Martinez up the road like they did today briefly um, in a move that was brought in as well. So Ineos, they've got control of the race now. They're in the Maglia Rosa and um, yeah, they look pretty ominous. I'm going to say that, Guillaume. So we've mentioned Egan Bernal's dominant win. Uh, taking a look at the rest of the top 10, we have seven seconds down Giulio Ciccone and Alexander Vlasov. Uh, Ciccone, who announced this morning that he was going to go for the GC of this Giro d'Italia. Um, I mean, we've had seen um, some previews of him being probably the best rider from Trek on this, uh, on this Giro, but he hadn't officially announced that he was going to go for the GC. That is now done, and with a very strong showcase showing, sorry, today, uh, taking second place ahead of Vlasov. Fourth place for Remco Venable. Uh, he loses 10 seconds. However, he was very far down um, with 1k to go. And to come back to get fourth place was a very, very good performance. So I feel like Remco definitely has the legs. The racing IQ might not have been there quite yet. Uh, but Remco definitely has the legs. He loses 10 seconds, but he could well eventually have finished with the likes of Chikone and Vlasov, in my opinion. Um, alongside him is Dan Martin. And then we've got a massive group, 12 seconds behind, led by Damiano Caruso from Baron Victorious. Uh, Romain Bardet, Marc Sola, Dan Martinez, Joe Almeida, David Formolo, Hugh Carthy, Buchmann, and uh, Simon Yates wrapping up the group. So no leader losing time today. If only uh, Attila Valta, who I had said that day could have been the day where he loses pink. Uh, he didn't look particularly great in uh, the climb of um, the, the, the former Telas climb. I think it was Ovin, Ovindoli, yeah. Don't quote me on that. Uh, and yeah, he, he lost about 45 seconds, meaning that he's now fifth of the general classification uh, GC, led by the new Maria Rosa, Egan Bernal. Yeah, so first looking, I guess, at Remco, you said he was out of position somewhat at the foot of the climb. I wonder if it was more related to he just didn't have the, the quick acceleration to follow the, the first attack from Egan Bernal, and he kind of worked his way slowly through the group rather than a lack of IQ, because... I feel like he hasn't positioned himself too badly throughout the race so far. Um, but I feel like he was struggling at times throughout today. But like you say, really great recovery by Remco to be among the best of the GC guys, even though they're, of course, very tightly packed there. So a good sign for Remco. I wouldn't say this finish suits him very well at all. I think maybe the slightly longer kind of mid, mid-range mid efforts in the climb suits him much more than today, that that quick two kilometer, three kilometer final burst at the, at the graveled section. So... I think Remco can be happy today. Obviously, he was primed to go into the Maglia Rosa today, assuming Atia Volta uh, loses the jersey, which he has done, of course. Um, he hasn't been able to follow Bernal, which means we won't have a first Belgian wearer of the Maglia Rosa for 20 years, I think. Um, not yet, at least. We'll see. But but yeah, I, I think Remco can be happy today. Oh, he definitely can. It was, as you said, a finish that didn't really suit him. Uh, and I believe that GC-wise, he's probably like... 15, 16 seconds down, if my maths are correct, uh, on Bernal. So it's like yeah, easy, easily catchable if he stays there with the final time trial, obviously. Uh, then GC wise, we move up to Vlasov in third place, Chikone fourth, Valtor in fifth, uh, Carthy Caruso, Martin Yates, and David Formolo wrapping up the top 10. Um, and then, yeah, some of the riders didn't, much, didn't make much noise today. Uh, the likes of Yates and Buchmann didn't see much from them. I think the only time I saw Buchmann today was when he took a rain jacket. Uh, at the downhill of the Ovindoli. Uh, Hugh Carthy with a very active EF team. You had uh, Ruben Guerrero as your favorite for today's stage. Mm -hmm. Very active in the breakaway alongside Simon Carr. Uh, but sadly, they just didn't have the legs to, um, to go through and, uh, and take the win. I mean, it was close, wasn't it? They had a fair lead coming into the final few kilometers, but the, the pace was just unbelievable from the Peloton and the Ineos Grenadiers. They gave them no chance there. And it was lovely to see, I must say, Egan Bernal win his first Grand Tour stage, something that you, you don't really think about. You assume he won a stage at that Tour de France he won, uh, but that stage was neutralized on stage 20. So yeah, great to see. You could see in his interview as well, he was a little emotional um, after winning his first Grand Tour stage. So that was nice to see, even though a bit of heartbreak for, for Jeffrey Bouchard and uh, Kuhn Bauman from that breakaway. But yeah, like you say, Bookman, Carthy, guys like that, not particularly punchy. They'll be very satisfied not to lose any real time today. I'm sure of that. Same for Simon Yates. We haven't really mentioned Simon Yates at all throughout the first nine stages of this Giro d'Italia. 
He sits 55 seconds down. I mean, he is right there. It's still a tightly patched general classification and this Jared Italia is far from one, even though Ineos and Egan Bernal look so, so dominant right now. Absolutely. I think every time, or well, as soon as we've mentioned Simon Yates, it was to criticise his performances. But as we said, he's only 55 seconds down, which is not too bad um, for, for Simon Yates. Uh, also interesting, maybe star pace today for Mark Seller. Maybe um, this final starting to have some decent legs, but seems some um, glimpses of hope during Romandie. Uh, Mark Seller only sitting one minute 20 down at uh, the same time as Romain Bardet. Romain, who was, my, well, he was meant to be second, according to my predictions today. Uh, he tried to follow Bernal, but I think he just blew up um, in the wheel of the Colombian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he did. I think he did. I think Chicone as well was the closest to following him, but I think Chicone quickly realised that was probably a bad idea trying to do that in the final. Looking at some of the, the minor losers today then, I think Vincenzo Nibali lost a little time. He lost, I think, 35 seconds to Bernal. Also further back, Pale Bilbao, over a minute down um, on, of course, Egan Bernal, which really does now put Dami Damiano Crusoe in the sole leadership position, I think, of Bahrain. Bilbao, looking at the GC, he's 21st over three minutes, 26 seconds down. So I feel like it's probably best for Bahrain victorious if they really focus on Crusoe, who looks to have great legs right now. Has to be said, he, uh, he was aggressive today, um, apparently feeling good. So I'm not sure what Bahrain's tactics are going to be going forward. Do they try and keep Bilbao three and a half minutes down in the GC? Or do they focus fully on, on Crusoe now? I'm not sure. Um, I think um, if I was dead, yes, I would probably like have Peyu dropped one day uh, and then you get some uh, some free range in the mountain with him and Gino Meda, who's still somewhat there for um, for the Mania at Sura. Uh, and you focus solely on the GC for Caruso. Um, it is, however, has to be mentioned, they have such a streak of bad luck. I mean, they've lost Landa. Yesterday, Peyu Bilbao crashed. And today, they lose Matej Moric on... A very very dumb crash. It's just the front of his bike. Uh, I think it's the fork of his bike just snapped in half, uh, and he just sadly has to go out of the race. Um, and hopefully everything will be fine for uh, for Mate. We wish him a speedy recovery. But uh, yeah, they they have unreal bad luck. Unreal bad luck. Uh, they've got six riders left now on this Giro. I think that the second team that lost the more the most after uh, Lotto Sudar, who's lost three riders in two days. Uh, they lost Caleb Yun yesterday. And today they lost Jasper de Boist and uh, Tomas Marzinski. It's not the greatest of Giro either for the Tosuda. No, that's quickly, uh, that team quickly getting whittled away at. They won't be riding in tomorrow's sprint stage for sure. But still, I mean, we have signs of the GC battle. It's still very close and I'm very much looking forward to uh, that starting again straight after the rest day. So looking ahead to stage 10 now of the Giro Italia, the final stage before the first rest day of this year's race. So um, a real chance now for the GC riders to put their feet up really because we have a sprint stage heading from L'Aquila to Foligno. Sorry, so a few climbs. There's one categorised climb later on in the race, but that's with 40k to go. It's a fourth category climb. It's not too difficult. We may see Bora push on there, but I highly doubt that. So I'm expecting to see a full-on mass sprint finish in the town of Foligno tomorrow. So, Guillaume, do you have any thoughts ahead of this? This uh, I think it's the fourth sprint stage on paper now of this Giro. It is indeed. Uh, it's going to be interesting because it's, I believe, just under 140 kilometers. So it should be a very fast, uh, a very fast paced stage. Sorry. Um, and with there's quite a lot of elevation in the first two thirds of the stage. Now, whether we'll see a sprint, I think so. However, we could see a breakaway trying to uh, disrupt the, um, the chances of the sprinters, uh, trying to get some time in the hilly portions of the stage. Uh, there's only like 40 kilometers from the summit of the fourth cat till the end. And most of it is downhill. So we'll have to see how that goes. Um, but I believe we will see a fourth mass sprint and, uh, well, what I can tell you is that Caleb Ewan will not win tomorrow. <laughs> Caleb Ewan certainly will not win tomorrow. The, that's really the, the first talking point, isn't it? The rider that isn't here, uh, Caleb Ewan, withdrawing yesterday. So that puts the likes of Tim Merlia, maybe Giacomo Nizzolo, dare I say it, Elia Viviani, Dylan Grunewagen among the, the top favourites and really opens the doors for those guys again because Caleb Ewan looked absolutely dominant in those two most recent sprints. And he'd have been a massive favourite heading into this stage as well. So have you got your eye on anyone particularly, Guillaume? Or do you think it might be a breakaway? I think it's going to be a mass sprint. I would like to see a breakaway. It would be fun uh, to, to see the breakaway disrupt the, the, the sprinters. But I think we'll have a mass sprint. 
um, do you have my eye specifically on someone? My answer has to be no, um, because I mean I think Caleb Young was the strongest, and then we've got a bit more of a of a level playing field uh, since the Aussie has gone. Uh, but should I give a name for the wind uh, for the win? Sorry, um, I think I'm gonna go for a second win of Tim Merlier on this Giro d'Italia. Second place is going to be Elia Viviani, and third place will be Giacomo Nizzolo. And Gabriel will be fourth because he'll have an issue with Morado yet again. <laughs> but he won't go into the barriers this time. They won't collide. No. Let's hope not. Um, that's an interesting one. So I think Malia probably will be the favourite on the day. Um, he looks absolutely, absolutely electric in that stage two time trial, you have to say. Um, but I'm going to go for a position more from the heart, perhaps. I'll go for Giacomo Nizzolo to claim... <laughs> Finally, his first Giro d'Italia stage win. It's going to be stage 10 of the 2021 Giro d'Italia where Nizzolo finally gets that first win after now 11, 11 runner-up places. I mean, it sounds unreal. How can you have 11 runner-ups without a win? But somehow he's done it, and this is the day it finally ends for Nizzolo. And to round out my podium, I'll go for Tim Merlier in second place and maybe Fernando Gaviria in third. I think he's... um. He's looked pretty uh, lively at the race so far in, in some aspects. Hasn't quite got the results so far, but I think we can maybe see his best his best sprint at least so far at the race. Uh, we'll see. I just hope he's recovered from the crash he's had uh, in yesterday's stage, uh, which looked somewhat benign, but it was on his hand. And you never know, for a sprinter, you need to be in the best of conditions, uh, especially on a playing field where everyone is somewhat similar. Uh, so we'll see how that goes for the Colombian. Uh, but you are backing Giacomo Nizzolo for his first win. I am backing Tim Maria for his second win on this Giro d'Italia. We'll see how that goes. But this is where we're going to wrap up this podcast. We do hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, then please make sure to leave a like down below and to subscribe if you are listening over on YouTube. If you are listening to your streaming platforms, then be sure to follow us on those respective platforms. And we will be there tomorrow for the debut recap number 10. As I said, sorry again for the um, lack of debut recap 7 and 8. Uh, but those technical issues have been fixed. Uh, and we're we're not leaving. We're staying. Don't worry. Uh, but yeah, Joe, do you have a final word in this uh, podcast? Giacomo's day tomorrow. Ah, uh, we sure hope so. Have an incredible day, guys. See ya. Cheers.